Hi, everyone. I should be recording now. I see the flashing red dot. Um, so thank you for coming to my virtual YouTube thing. Uh, so my name is Matt Levine. I'm a graduate student at Caltech uh, with Andrew Stewart. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work on uh, machine learning of model error in uh, differential equations. Uh, how do I change? There we go. Um, yep, so I'll just start out with um, an introduction and then uh, go into some details and then end. That's how things go, right? Um, so I think everyone here is pretty excited about machine learning. Um, it has a lot of promise for, you know, fitting data. Um, and of course, it works beautifully well when you have enough data. Um, and at the same time, you know, physical models are awesome as well. Um, when you know enough about a system, then physics is great. Um, unfortunately, uh, in most open prediction problems, somehow we, they're open problems. And so we don't have enough, either we don't have enough data to whack it with a machine learning method. And we don't have enough like understanding of the science to, to have a good uh, mechanistic model, or, or maybe we don't have enough uh, compute power to, to simulate from our model. And so uh, in my opinion, um, the, the next generation of prediction models that we'll have, the, we'll kind of see the most success are going to somehow hybridize um, physical modeling and data driven techniques so that you kind of get the both best of both worlds with whatever physical knowledge you have about a system you're going to use that directly and you're also going to exploit the data as much as you can and have a flexible um, function approximation framework to to fit whatever is wrong with the the physical model or potentially just throw it out entirely and only trust the data um, and so kind of where I'm starting with this is trying to ask the question of how do we lay the groundwork for this future? And I say future, but it's also a present. Um, and many of the speakers in this conference are working on exactly these types of things. And I tried to list some of the, the big hits at the end of my talk in the bibliography. Um, but you know, if you feel that you've worked on this stuff as well, and maybe I just haven't seen the paper, I would love for you to send it to me because I'm really trying to understand how everyone is approaching these problems because it's quite new. Uh, although not that new, I have, um, I know Yanis uh, Kevrikitis has worked on this even 25 years ago. Um, but so if we take, um, I'm going to start with a system of interest, which is a, a multi, potentially multi-scale system. Um, so you have some uh, system of equations where you have dynamics on an X variable and dynamics that are coupled to a Y variable. Um, and so we want to view this system as the truth. This is a very general uh, claim about the underlying dynamics of a system. Um, and you might think of X being a, a slower system, maybe it's one that you can observe or that maybe you care about more and Y is maybe some of the details of the system um, that maybe you don't observe or don't understand how they work. Um, and so this is going to be our idea of the generating process of like reality. Um, so in particular, we're going to start with saying that this G dagger is not even known at all. And we uh, only know F dagger partially well. So specifically, we're going to assume that we have some F zero, uh, which is a function only on X, which is kind of like our course model of how the dynamics on X works to the best of our knowledge. And then there's some residual term that exists. That's just the difference between F zero and F dagger, um, which is coupled to X and Y. And so this M dagger we're thinking of as the true model error function to our F zero. Um, and ideally, if our F0 is good, then M dagger is small. Um, we still might be interested in trying to learn it. Um, and so here I'm talking about trying to learn this model error function from a trajectory uh, on the X variable and without any observation on the Y variable. Um, and so this framing poses that there in fact exists a closure function um, m that captures the entire effect of the y system on x as long as it has some form of memory. So here you can see that this closure term incorporates the entire history of x as well as the initial condition of y. Um, and so this is enough to actually have complete dynamics on x that are entirely correct. So if you give me the initial condition on x and y and the entire uh, state history of x, um, then this, there exists a function that can tell me exactly where X will be in the future um, that completely corresponds to the, the true system. Um, of course, we 
can't access this, this um, exactly, but we might want to approximate it or learn it from data. Um, and so in general, when, especially when it needs memory, um, we need some way of dealing with that. And so one way to deal with that is to have some kind of delay coordinates. Um, the way that we're looking at it right now is with uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, so, uh, and, and actually frame this in continuous time. So we have a, a theorem that we're still working on, but we think it's right. Um, and looking forward to uh, reviews when we submit that off, um, is that solutions X to our original equation can be approximated by um, a dynamical system whose residuals are governed by a continuous time RNN of this form. Um, and we are not the first ones to write down a continuous time RNN. Um, I know Eldad wrote this down a few years ago and people have followed up with that and other people had probably been thinking about it for quite a long time. Um, but the claim here is simply that uh, we have an approximation theory um, for, uh, for a given um, embedding dimension and parameters. Uh, how do I change? There we go. Um, but you know, it gets a little bit more interesting because if the scale separation, which is governed by this parameter epsilon, um, gets very small, then you might be able to imagine that the Y dynamics are sufficiently mixing for a fixed X. And then we can think of a closure term that actually only depends on X and doesn't need to incorporate memory. Um, and so that's where we're writing equation seven, where this is kind of a, a reduced, um, uh, a simpler case and it's also a way in which when you think you might have a small amount of memory or maybe you don't think it's that important, um, this is a reasonable way to study a system. Um, so in fact, there's probably always some light Y variables that are coupled to whatever experimental system you're looking at and maybe they just don't have that strong of an impact. Um, so you can also think of this as when you just are observing the full system, then there, might, there, there just exists some residual term uh, M bar of X. And so here we try to learn this M bar with a Gaussian process regression. Um, as I mentioned before, when we try to incorporate memory, we're, we're using some kind of uh, recurrent neural network structure. Um, right, so in summary, this is our um, kind of governing system. For large epsilon, we can think of the system as having some memory and we propose using an RNN that we put into the um, continuous dynamics. And this solves the problem of having a memory full closure term. Um, and when epsilon is very, very small, then you can think of this as a memoryless problem. Um, you can use any kind of uh, supervised regression technique. Here we're using Gaussian process regression and it provides a closure of this form with M bar. Okay, um, so let me see how I'm doing on time. So um, there might be a few things that you care about when actually learning this function, you probably wanna learn um, to have improved forecasting of trajectories. Um, and you also want to be able to capture the invariant distribution of the true underlying system and probably some of its um, autocorrelation statistics um, as well. And specifically, we hope that when F0 approaches F dagger, in other words, when our prior physical knowledge is better and better, and the error is smaller, um, then all of these things should get better. Um, so whatever process we apply for learning our model error, if we start with a better model, we would hope and expect that um, we end up with a better corrected model at the end, where it makes the training simpler, faster, et cetera. And the other thing that should help is when we do try to correct the model. So as long as um, F0 isn't perfect, then learning something on top of it should improve all of these things as well. Um, so first, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm going to go through this quickly. And if you want to study this carefully, I suggest just kind of pausing it because I think a lot of folks might know what these next couple slides are. And so it might be kind of boring. Uh, but just basically, this is defining um, trajectory forecasting um, for our different models, where we're making a claim about the validity time of how long it takes for two trajectories to diverge. Um, and so we're on the left, we're saying that the, um, the first time that the true solution diverges from our corrected solution XM um, by more than a factor gamma, um, that's what we're calling the validity time. 
And we hope that that validity time is larger than the validity times for either the nominal physical solution, which we're denoting by x0, or the validity time by xd. So um, that's the structure here. And then similarly, we hope that um, our hybrid model, xm, uh, produces an invariant measure that is closer to the true invariant measure than either only using the nominal physics model, which we're calling, saying that it has some invariant measure mu zero. And it also, we also hope that the, um, the invariant measure from the hybrid model is better than the purely data-driven one, um, which we're calling mu d. And so we can, th you know, there are different ways to measure distances between um, probability distributions. But here I think that it's reasonable to think about the KL divergence because it's kind of a measure of information loss itself. It's not actually a, a distance metric on probability measures, but it is designed to capture the information loss from some true signal to an approximation of that signal. And so that's what we're looking at here. Um, and finally, we can also look at um, the autocorrelation statistics and expect that in some norm, the um, autocorrelation function from our hybrid model should be closer to the true autocorrelation function than only using data or only using um, the model. Um, so, okay, so we're going to start with um, problems that don't involve memory. In other words, where epsilon is very, very small, and we're going to use Gaussian process regression. And then I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about um, the work that we're going to do with uh, RNNs. But um, yeah, first, um, as, as maybe is quite obvious, you know, data aren't continuous. So if we collect a sequence of data, it's probably going to be at some kind of sampling rate. Here we're assuming uniform sampling rate. Um, and so we're calling xn, um, x at time n times delta t. So we have a sequence of xn's. Um, and then we can define model error at some time tn as mn, which is just the discrepancy between the derivative uh, x dot n and the um, right-hand side of our known model, f0 of xn. So now we have pairings of states xn that are, you know, true um, measurements from the system, at least the slow part of the system, the x coordinates, um, and, and uh, the model error. And so you can try to learn a map between those two with Gaussian process regression. Okay, so we just talked about how um, we wanna compile uh, these pairings of xn and mn, but of course mn is not uh, directly available to us um, unless we're actually measuring the derivatives. So if you have just um, a sequence of data, you have to do some kind of differencing to approximate the derivatives. And so that's what we're looking at here. And we're calling this kind of a continuous time approach because we're trying to learn actually the um, model error of the right-hand side. Um, so here we're just using a um, forward difference um, and this should give us a correction term. Um, however, you, know, you can also think about a correction term on the discrete time map. So if we define psi zero as um, mapping xn to xn plus one through the um, function f zero, then this is our kind of naive delta t forward map that we, we know about. Um, and so then we can think about uh, learning residuals to, to that function as mn. And that's the difference between the true next step xn plus one and the naive psi zero prediction um, divided by some delta t. So of course these two things are connected. On one hand, we're just learning residuals to the um, solution map. And on the other hand, we're trying to learn residuals to the right-hand side of the ODE. Um, but for very small time steps, um, these are actually quite similar. If you think about psi zero is actually applying um, a forward Euler scheme to um, our F zero model, then these things, uh, the, the continuous time kind of model error and the discrete time where we're just correcting the solution map, these things become basically the same up to a factor of delta t. Um, however, for large delta t, this is small, but for large delta t, um, derivatives are going to be harder to infer from data. And so, you know, we might actually not be able to do full, uh, finite differencing. Um, and the continuous time method is going to suffer. It might be impossible to actually learn a good right-hand side um, once you have sparse enough data, or, or it becomes a very um, uh, 
almost ill-posed in, inverse problem, if you will. Um, however, the residuals to size zero are still very accessible to us and can be learned as easily as if there was a um, small time step, provided you're, uh, you have a high fidelity um, forward solver. So we're gonna look at an example using the Lorenz 96 multi-scale system. Where here, this is kind of exactly the, the case that I described to you, where you have dynamics only in the slow variable X, where X's are coupled to each other, um, but they're also driven, each, each X component has a subgroup of fast variables Y, which all kind of uh, obey a similar behavior to um, the X variables, but they're only coupled to one single um, XK. And so those drive XK as HX and their average Y bar K. Um, and epsilon here is the scale separation parameter. So it's governing how fast each of these groups of Ys are spinning around uh, relative to their coupled XKs. And so the modeler scenario we're looking at is we're assuming that we're observing the true X variables from this uh, system, but we only know the physics for this FK term. So we don't know anything about the Y bar Ks and we don't know how um, their dynamics are governed. And so we're looking to infer these residual terms, HX Y bar one to HX Y bar K. And so we can um, apply an averaging hypothesis that assumes that for a very small epsilon, um, there's a, a simple additive residual term that is only a function of XK. And so here we um, exploit some of the um, interchangeability in this particular system and split the uh, closure term into component wise terms. So now we have an M that maps R to R to build something that goes from RK to RK. Um, and so here I'm showing on the left our um, data collection where in the gray dots we have um, the from we so we do a high fidelity simulation of the full multi scale system and we're plotting on the x, uh, x axis the values of xk and on the y axis we're plotting the residual terms the actual evaluations of the residual terms using the high fidelity solver. So the high fidelity solver is actually evaluating these Y bars and we're plotting them here. Um, and then as we're taking a subset in the red dots and fitting a Gaussian process regression uh, in blue to those red dots. Um, and then separately, we're only taking the, uh, the slow variables from that high fidelity simulation and we're doing finite differencing and trying to infer um, the residual error terms. And those are the green crosses. And you can see that um, the green crosses are very close to the red dots, meaning that our finite difference method is quite accurate at this time scale, which is 10 to the minus four. And as a result, the Gaussian process that we train for those inferred um, green crosses is quite similar to the, um, to the uh, the other closure model. And so both of these models really nicely reproduce the invariant measure. You can see that the true invariant measure from the a high fidelity solver is in black and both the blue and the um, orange are the uh, Gaussian process uh, closure models. Um, and they perform really nicely and that's because um, epsilon is very small in our case. I think it's um, two to the minus seven. And so it's effectively memory list, the problem. And you can see in gray is what you would get if you only used um, the FK. So if you didn't couple it to another system and you didn't have a closure model, you would get um, a substantially different kind of variance in mode uh, for the dynamics. And then we can also look at the autocorrelation statistics and we see that just like the invariant measure, um, we do a really good job of reproducing the autocorrelation um, where the blue, black, and uh, orange all overlap here. And the, the, slow, the only using the um, naive physics without a closure and without the extra um, fidelity, uh, you don't do so well, right? And then on the right-hand side, we're looking at the validity times where all of these guys um, show substantially better uh, validity times than only using the um, original kind of naive physics model. And so it's just to point out, these are 
On the left, we're looking at um, the discrete case where you're learning residuals to size zero. And on the right side, where we're learning actually correction terms to the um, right-hand side of the ODE. And here we see that um, whether we're using the um, residual terms from the high fidelity solver or from finite differencing using only slow data, doesn't matter. We get equally good performance here. Uh, but now if we shift the time scale, uh, sorry, the sampling rate down, so now we're measuring at 10 to the minus three, you can see that there's a little bit of difference between the solutions to our finite differencing versus the true residual errors. But overall, that it mostly looks like noise, and so we learn a very similar Gaussian process regression again. Um, so the, the closure terms are, are pretty nicely reflective of what they would be in, in reality, or idealized from the data. And so again, the um, invariant distribution is nicely reproduced. And um, again, we have good validity times that aren't impacted by whether you um, are inferring or using the true residuals and the autocorrelation is good. Okay, what I really wanted to get to is this plot where finally we take a small enough, uh, sorry, a large enough step size. You have a basically the sampling rate uh, of the data that the, is a lot um, wider. So we're still using the same fidelity uh, forward solvers. It's just that we're, um, we're subsampling them at a coarser time intervals. And so here we see that because of that, our finite differencing method breaks down. And you know, you can complain about the way that we do differencing, but the reality is that no, no differentiation method is going to do well at a slow enough sampling rate relative to the dynamics unless you know all of the dynamics. But here, we don't know the dynamics. So fundamentally, this problem will show up at some point, no matter how you set up the, the situation. And as a result, you can see that we learned two very different closure models. Um, and now the closure model from uh, this continuous inference perspective um, doesn't look right anymore. It has these new shoulders and it doesn't match the black curve. And similarly, um, it doesn't really have the same autocorrelation structure, and um, it's this represented by this pink bar on the far right. It's also um, quite a bit lower in terms of uh, time validity from some of the other methods. Um, however, you can see here this discrete GP share. This is uh, the Gaussian process regression on uh, psi zero, on just the solution map. So you can see that we still have validity time two when we're learning corrections of the delta t forward map. So even though you know, we're mapping forwards in time a longer amount of time, we're still using just RK45 with the same tolerances, but this is still a trackable problem. Um, correcting the right-hand side of the ODE becomes a much more difficult problem as sampling rate goes down. So just to point out, this is at 2.0 validity time. And if I go back, even for 10 to the minus four, we weren't really doing much better than that. I mean, the I wouldn't trust that these are actually lower. These look like their medians are 1.8 or something, but the point is we're not doing worse at all in correcting the solution map with slower time steps. Um, and so some of the upcoming work we have is trying to learn, um, learn a memory full closure. So where epsilon is a little bit larger and these averaging hypotheses kind of start to break down. And so we can do that by uh, growing the epsilon to maybe two to the minus six, two to the minus fifth, two to the minus four. Um, and similarly train the RNN using an Euler discretization of the continuous time framing. Um, and the, the other way that you can think about this is that maybe we're just going to learn an RNN as uh, discrete residuals from the solution map. So, um, so I don't have results on this, so I'm kind of just kind of breezing through this quickly. But so on one hand, if you recall, we had this continuous RNN in equation 16, and you can try to tr train this to data by, as before with the closure model, writing down a, a forward Euler discretization or, or perhaps a, uh, a fancier one, but we're just sticking to Euler for simplicity. 
So you write down an Euler discretization of this method. And now because there's recurrence, um, you can't just do a regression the way we did before, you know, subtract xn and divide by delta t or whatever. Um, but what you can do is train this the same way you would train any other RNN. You can do back propagation. Um, and it's worth noting that you can also, and we have some preliminary results with this, train a model like this for reservoir computing, in which case um, you're not trying to learn h, i, or phi. You actually in randomize those initially, and then that creates a um, fixed recurrent state whose map G you learn once outwards. And so that actually is a regression problem. So that's kind of cool. And we have some initial results on that. If anyone wants to talk about that, um, we can do that. Um, and then as I mentioned, the other thing that we can look at is um, just the residuals on the discrete map size zero. Um, and so here, this is the more classical um, application of an RNN. It doesn't have a continuous time um, understanding uh, because if you change delta t, uh, aren't the, this shifts in in meaning. Um, but it still might work better in practice because this is a lot of the times how RNNs have been developed to perform well. Um, so in conclusion, Okay, so we were able to learn memoryless closure terms to Lorenz 96 multiscale with Gaussian process regression. And this is something that other people have seen. Um, and it's important to note that for fast sampling rate, it works great to learn the right hand side, but for slow sampling rate, at some point your, uh, your differentiation scheme is gonna uh, break down and it's not gonna get any better if you don't know the full model. And so um, at that point, uh, you might have better hope of just correcting your size zero, just your solution map forwards from that delta t time. Um, and that that actually works quite well still for reproducing the invariant measure and predicting trajectories. I don't think I showed the um, quality of the invariant measure for um, correcting the solution map, but it's really good. Um, so the next steps we have are, I mean, there are many, many next steps. So one big next step is getting a lot of these results that I have for um, the, the memory list case, getting them uh, ready for uh, the memory full case where we're actually an RNN or an LSTM or something like that greatly improves uh, prediction quality. So, so what I'm looking for is as we change epsilon, as we change the scale separation, you have more and more memory in the system and slowly the Gaussian process with only on you know, the slow observed variables, that closure term is gonna become less and less useful. And the memory in an RNN or an LSTM is gonna become more and more valuable. And so we wanna kind of see that gradation of quality between the two models where they switch. Where on one end for the no memory closure, the RNN is probably overkill. Um, whereas the Gaussian process really shines and vice versa. Um, and so we also want to do this with noisy data. Um, we want to further formalize our theory for approximations in um, the memory case with RNNs. Um, we also want to develop theory that relates the quality of F0 to the reconstruction quality. So I want something that tells me that in some norm, if F, as F0, you know, the, the distance between F0 and F dagger, the true, um, the true right-hand side, that, that as those get closer, my inference is easier or the quality of my predictions at the end are just gonna be better. Um, and there's also some interesting theory work to be done for um, approximation theory and Gaussian process regressions when your data are not necessarily IID, but are actually coming from um, trajectories. So we're, we're not exactly sure how to approach that, but we're interested. So if you have Thoughts on that, we'd also love to hear from you. Um, so now I'm gonna just like flip through a lot of related work and thank you for your time. And I look forward to talking with you at some point. So I, I'm gonna be giving a live talk. Um, I don't remember when that is, but so if you want to come to that or if you just decided to skip to the end of this, um, you can just come to the live talk and I'll probably do a shorter version. Um, but yeah, so thank you for your attention. Uh, stop recording.